when the text block is made up, you might be able to put a marker at about chapter 4, somewhere along in there, and you'll be right where you need to be for the rest of my time up here with you tonight. We're going to be mostly in Romans, the end of Romans 4 and the beginning of Romans 5, but we're going to start in Romans chapter 3 as we contemplate the idea tonight of being justified by faith from Romans 4 dash 5. But tonight, not so much that alone. Tonight is more, you could have, I didn't put it, but you could put this like a subtitle and it could be a question. It could be justified by faith and then the question, now what? Or what now? What, What comes after that? What does it look like in practice, in the real world, beyond just on the pages of Scripture, and and that's not important, I mean, we're reading from them and studying them tonight, beyond theological expressions and statements and discussions, what does it mean to be justified by faith? What is the result of being justified before God, to God, by God, according to our faith? As you think through this letter that Paul writes to the Christians in ancient Rome, if you pick up in the beginning of the heart of the letter, in about verse 18 of chapter 1, you don't necessarily have to turn back there, but you can. I'm not going to force you not to. But he starts there talking about humanity, but more how humanity has gone wrong. The way of the nations, as I put it on the handout tonight, the idolatry, the sin, the depth of rejection, of humanity against their God. And that's most of chapter 1, or the big second half of chapter 1. Then chapter 2 of Romans, where we're having our own road through the the Roman road here tonight, really quick. But chapter 2 looks at hypocrisy and the final coming judgment. If you had to just really quickly summarize it, it would be those two pieces, those two ideas, hypocrisy and coming final judgment. But at the end of chapter 2, that carries over into chapter 3, Paul looks a little closer at the Israelites, the Jewish nation, and how they fit into this whole picture, this whole story of God and the nations, God and humanity, and how Israel was on a mission by, by God, but they failed that mission quite terribly, quite miserably. And then as you get about halfway through chapter 3, Paul looks at, in contrast with humanity and especially Israel's unfaithfulness, for Israel to God's law, to God's covenant, they had every advantage, every benefit. He then looks at God's faithfulness, at God's justification of humanity. So we pick up with Paul in this letter and the overall argument in verse 26. So we're going to begin reading, at least, of chapter 3. We read these words. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he, the pronoun here is both times the reference to God, who's worked to redeem us by the blood of Jesus, verse 24, who had passed over sins previously committed, verse 25, so that he might be just, And the justifier, so God's justice remains in place, but he also justifies or makes righteous, makes right, declares in the right, the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. This is where we are in Romans. The humanity and sin, Israel's failings, God's But then as you start reading the next chapter, it's like Paul jumps ship. He starts talking about Abraham and asking questions about Abraham's faith and Abraham being declared righteous. That part at least connects justification by faith. But why does Paul mention Abraham here of all places? This letter is very building, very structured. It is not... Someone said it's not a collection of essays, little essays that were compiled. It is 
a letter that is meant to be followed from really verse 1 to the end of chapter 16. I mention Abram. There, there's something about Abraham and the covenant God made with Abraham, the promises God made to Abraham that relate to being justified by faith in Jesus, Romans 3.26. As you keep reading chapter 4, verses 9 through 12 of Romans 4 is where Paul explains that God, all along in God's mind, but in the the way history flowed, God redefined what it means to be in the family of Abraham. And God fulfills the promises made to Abraham, not through Abraham himself, not through Israel, but through an Israelite, through a Jew, through Jesus. But keep in mind that Jesus is not mentioned in chapter 4 until you get to the very end. Isn't that something to scratch your head about? What's that about? But he concludes in verse 12 that it's the people who are circumcised, the Jews, and the people that are uncircumcised, the non-Jews, all of them are a part of what what began with Abraham. God is creating this new family with Abraham's call. Both of those by their faith. And then read verse 16 with me. Romans 4, verse 16. He says, that is why. Or your version might have therefore. It is the word that we usually translate therefore. So because of this, he just discussed about Abraham and circumcision and how that wasn't what justified Abraham. It was his faith. He says, that is why it depends on faith in order that the promise, let's also keep in our heads that it, in verse 16, seems to be, given the context, the promises made to Abraham. So the promises didn't depend on the law or circumcision because the law really, the law came quite some time after, after Abraham. Circumcision was a part of Abraham's life, but after his faith justified him before God. And then he said this, that the promise may rest on grace, not merit, and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, his fleshly offspring, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, spiritual children of Abraham. As it is written, he now appeals back to Genesis, I have made you the father of many nations. It might be easy for us to forget as we start thinking about Abraham and the promises made to Abraham. All along, God told Abraham, in the original set of promises, I'm going to make you the father, not just of one nation that we would later call Israel, but of many nations. Or could we say of many people who are from different physical, earthly, national identities or nations. This is how Abraham and what God did with Abraham, Paul says, these aren't two different stories. Sometimes we look at, the, look at it that way, I think. There, there's God calls Abraham and he creates Israel. And, and then sometime later, God does something different, and that's Jesus and the church. But it's all one story for Paul. It's all part of God's story of redemption. So on the basis of that, we're going to do this pretty briefly, all right? Let's look at the undoing that takes place. Starting here in verse 17, really now into verse 18 of Romans chapter 4, we see the undoing. Abraham and his faith, is this description here in, in this paragraph, how Paul describes him, he and his faith are the total opposite of what was described by Paul in chapter 1. Look at verse 18, or the rest of verse 17, rather. After he quotes the scripture, he says, in the presence of the God in whom he believed, this is Romans four seventeen, who gives life to the dead, and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Now, Paul's not saying God's crazy, and God's talking about things that 
aren't never going to exist. What he's saying is that God is the God who has the power to speak things into existence. Like when God speaks the entire universe. And God says, let there be light. And what happens? There's light. He's God that looks and he can make promises and make references to things that aren't even reality yet. And the promises are that certain because God's power is that powerful. So God looks at Abraham, who's approaching a century old, and he says, Abraham, I'm going to make many nations out of you. I'm going to create, you're going to have a son, and all these blessings are going to come from you. And Abraham has never had any children. Abraham's kind of past that point. And Sarah has never had any children, and she's kind of past that point. But think back to chapter 1. You can flip over there and take a glance. Verse 20, verse 21, verse 25. There, the people, they know God's power. That's the one thing that Abraham and the people in chapter 1 share. They both get that in common. They both know God's power. One trusts in it. One throws it away and doesn't acknowledge it. Keep reading in chapter 4. It says in verse 18 that in hope he believed against hope. Abraham believed the impossible. That he, verse 18 continues, should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. Verse 19 now, he did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, Paul adds parenthetically, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. Think back to chapter 1, maybe this time go to verse 24 and following, where God gave them up and the people committed all sorts of unclean acts with their body. Now, in chapter 4, Abraham who knows the power of God, believes the power of God, when it's impossible what God has promised, that just doesn't happen, God. Have have you ever told God that? I I just don't think this can happen. It's impossible. And then instead of using his body to do the things that people did in chapter 1, it's still about his body, but Abraham looks at his body and he's thinking, I don't know, but I know God can use my body, even my body. Abraham believes against hope, as ironically as that is even in, as Paul writes it, besides start, when you start thinking about it. Look at verse 20, Romans 4, verse 20. He says, no unbelief made him waver. It's the picture of the reeds blowing in the wind. We don't know anything about trees and all sorts of things that get blown around out here. That's Abraham, it's not Abraham's faith, it's solid. Now, when we read Genesis, sometimes we think a little differently. But he did not waver, Paul says, concerning the promise of God, but grew strong in his faith as, watch this, he gave glory to God. What did the people in chapter 1 do? What did they not do? It says, although they knew God, they did not honor him or glorify him as God. Neither were they thankful, but They began to worship the creation instead of the creature. Verse 21, verse 25, chapter 1. And then he keeps going here in chapter 4. He says, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That phrase in 21 is pretty simple. But it'd be one of those verses in scripture that's easy to read through. Yeah, Abraham believed God, big deal. It is a big deal. And it provides for us right here in this chapter the undoing that begins through Abraham of human idolatry and human the depth of human sinfulness. When God picks Abraham, he starts to undo something. It doesn't mean Abraham was perfect. But there's something about Abraham and the type of faith he had that's key in this chapter. And notice the definition of faith here. It's two parts. It's, I believe that God can do what he's promised.
And then secondly, because of that, because it's on faith and promise, not my ability or my law keeping, I give the credit to God. I give the glory to God. That's verse 20. So 20 and 21 right here give us a, a pretty workable definition of faith in the human heart toward God. But let's finish the chapter. Verse 22. That is why, or therefore, his faith was counted to him as righteousness, justified by faith. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone. Here's where what Paul makes it clear. This is not just a storybook discussion. This isn't just Abraham and God undoing things in Abraham. This is supposed to be about us. For the Roman Christians in the first century, for the, what do we call our, I don't know, I guess the Oklahoma Christians in the 21st century, the Elsidians, or however we, I don't know what we're called. Anyway, let's read the text. He says, it was written for our sake as well. Verse 24 says, it will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead, Jesus, our Lord. First time Jesus is mentioned by pronoun or name in 23 verses. Paul comes back and summarizes. Really, these two verses are a summary of everything Paul writes in the first four chapters of Romans. But also sets up for what's about to happen and Paul's going to unleash in chapter 5. Let's read them. Those who believe in the one who raised Jesus from the dead, our Lord, verse 25, who, Jesus that is, was delivered up for our trespasses, the cross, which where it's accomplished, the power to forgive trespasses in a covenant family with God, and, last part of the chapter, raised, resurrection, for our justification. And in my mind, being forgiven of trespasses and being justified, those are about the same idea. I don't know that Paul is saying the resurrection justifies or washes away our sins or makes us right before God. It's more that the resurrection says what happened at the cross is true. If Jesus had not been raised, well, it might say something about the cross, but maybe it's not true. Mark this down tonight. There's the undoing of idolatry and sin, but there's also the undoing of deadness. Abraham's faith and our faith, the faith that justifies tonight in Romans, is a faith that is centered, it is focused in on a God who can speak things into existence, a God who can speak and dead comes alive. Think back through what we just read in Romans 4. Abraham's body, Paul says it, was as good as dead. I'm not saying that for old Abraham, but that's what Paul says. He's, he was so old, he was as good as dead. Sarah's womb, the ESV translates it as barrenness, but it literally means deadness. That her womb was dead. You don't have children when your womb is dead. Jesus was dead. And dead people don't walk and talk and eat. They stay dead. But he did. So the resurrection of Jesus declares some things to us. It shouts that you can be justified by the blood of Jesus. And it shouts that Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of the living God. Romans 1.4 says that. Romans 4.25 says the former. That's the undoing of human idolatry and sin by faith in a God who undoes deadness. It does the impossible. Let's close tonight by looking at the first five verses of Romans chapter 5 the outcome. Where do we go from here? What does this look like now in our lives as disciples of Jesus? And the key phrase in these first five verses, if you had to, if you poured these verses in a strainer, the key phrase that you'd catch would be these words, peace with 
read it together. Romans 5. We'll read the first verse. Therefore, so because of what it means now to be in, the, in Abraham's family, where God's ancient promises become a full reality, because of what Jesus did on the cross and what his resurrection declares, because of that, since we have been justified by faith. And if you are in Jesus tonight, that is your reality. You have been, it's been done, justified by faith. What do we have? We have, and there it is, peace with God. How? If we didn't already know in the context, he then in, he finishes this sentence and says, through Jesus, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace? As a human being, like those in chapter 1, where my sin means I'm living in hostility against God. I am at war with my Creator. And my will and my life and my passions and all of that is contrary and against His. But He created me to be in union and harmony and relationship in a personal way. And that was lost, beginning in Eden. But now, to the undoing of God's work in Jesus and our faith in Jesus, we have peace. Because I'm justified, I'm right before God in Jesus, that's why I can lay down my head on my pillow. I'm at peace with God. I'm not no longer fighting with God. I'm no longer expecting God's judgment and wrath, whether I'm open to that or not. We spend a lot of our lives seeking peace and seeking hope. And those two, right here in Romans 5. Let's keep reading. There's more to it. There's peace with God. That's what it means. But there's more. Verse 2. He says, through Him, that is through Jesus, we have also obtained access. If I had to add words to the list of key words, there's a key phrase, peace with God, that word about access would be one. How? By faith. Into this grace, another big word, in which we stand. And not only that, he says, and we rejoice in the hope of what? Of the glory. Of God. So there's peace with God. That's where it starts but then it's meant to also mean access. It's language that describes coming into God's presence. And even though sometimes it may not look like it, it may not feel like it, if I've been justified by faith in Jesus tonight, I have it, whether I take advantage of it or not, that's another question, but I have, I've been introduced into the presence of the King. It could be it's temple language for Paul's Jewish audience. It's palace language for the pagan audience. It's like this morning when Bathsheba comes into the presence of Solomon. You just don't do that. But it's like Jesus has taken us and he's brought us into the temple of God. Oh, Isn't, aren't there some other passages where we are called the temple of God? But then it's also hope. We, we use the word hope a lot, don't we? We talk about, I hope I get that job. Kids at school, I, I hope they don't pick on me for what I'm wearing today. I hope our marriage gets better. I hope, I hope, I hope. And fairly often, that hope doesn't happen. So on that note, let's keep reading. We've got hope of the glory of God, the glory that was lost by our sin, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, is now there's hope that that can be regained. Let's finish these five verses together. As he then says, we rejoice in our suffering. Verse 3, not only that, 
And if you hadn't read the verse to verse 3 or had any idea what Paul, if you're reading this for the first time, it might just be me, but the way that it's written, it sounds like Paul's about to say something really great again. I mean, I have peace with God. I have access to the throne room of God and His grace bestowed upon me from His throne. I have hope. And you're like, what is Paul going to say? Not only that, but, I mean, can it get any better? So what does verse 3 say? I mean, I already said it. It's on the screen. He says, not only that, we rejoice. Oh, yeah, that sounds great. Joy. we got peace, grace, joy, hope. It's, the, it's more than a trio. It's this coupling. And, and then Paul had to go and write this. In our suffering. And let's not forget here that this is the Apostle Paul writing by inspiration, but this is the guy that was beaten and stoned and shipwrecked. And historically, there's a reason that Acts ends in Acts 28 with Paul in Rome. He goes back to Rome. And he's beheaded. Because I don't, it, it is not that Paul's saying we're still going to have some human weaknesses and sicknesses and troubles. That's true. Sufferings here in context, it's suffering because you're in Jesus. But Paul says we're, we're rejoicing in the, in the sufferings. Not necessarily that I'm excited that somebody's going to put me in prison, but I'm excited somebody's going to put me in prison because of what that means. Elsewhere, it's, I'm excited because I'm counted worthy to suffer for his name. The apostles rejoiced in Acts 4 because of that. Here, it's because of what it does to me. So keep reading. We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing, here's why, we know that suffering, and there's this chain link in these verses. They're all linked by chains. He says, knowing that suffering produces endurance. I should have some words. All right. Suffering produces endurance. So there's suffering that's about pressure. Have you ever heard somebody talk about diamonds aren't made without pressure? Well, the word for suffering here is about pressure. The pressure of beatings. The pressure of losing your job because you stand up for what's right. The pressure turns into endurance. And endurance means to be able to stand under heavy weight. I was watching... This afternoon, in fact, the video of a man who was picking up 45, 55-pound kegs, and he picks them up and throws them up in the air behind him, and it goes up and over this high uh, bar, I guess you'd call it. Pretty impressed. Ever watched any strongman competition? All the weight they can lift, deadlift and bench and all of that. Paul says when suffering, when pain falls upon our shoulders, produces endurance, produces strength, keep on when you don't want to keep on keeping on. But then he says endurance, look at this, it produces character. Your Bible might say it produces those, one who is approved or something like that because the word means to be tested like a fine metal. Do you see how this can all build together in Paul's pen, or from Paul's pen. So the pressure falls on you. You stand under it and you get stronger. And as you come out of it, character is now built because you've been tested like gold and refined by it. And we want everything now in our world, don't we? And no wonder that we might have a lack of character. Because these verses are, you can read them in a second or two, but they take time. Paul says your life as a Christian is going to take time to develop character that's solid. And then character produces hope. There's hope at the outset in verse 2. And that's true. When you come up out of the waters of baptism, you've got hope. But it's also true from another side of the, the, this table that Paul's laying out. There's more hope that comes to your heart when you suffer and you come out on the other side. And now you have even more 
Now, like Abraham, your hope is strong and not wavering because you got character. And then verse 5. In a world where it seems like every hope disappoints, Paul says this, and hope does not put us to shame. Hope does not, this, this hope doesn't disappoint us. Why? And this is another head scratcher. Because the reason that our hope is fulfilled is because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Is that this love that God has for us, this love that we then develop for God, God's love begins to live in our hearts because God loves me and I love God. And this is more, in some ways, more emotional than logical in a letter like Romans. That's kind of rare. Paul said it's because of God's love that we're not going to have any reason to be ashamed of our hope. Even when we're hoping against hope, even when society looks at us and laughs at us and makes fun of us because we're hoping in God to raise our dead bodies, and we're hoping in a God that we believe raised Jesus from the dead. And society says what? That's impossible. They probably told Abraham, it's impossible for you and Sarah to have a child. Our hope is locked in because God loves us. And we love God. That's the outcome. Being justified. But the difficult part is that it's not necessarily going to be easy. We're justified, peace, grace. But then we're quickly reminded that the life of a child of God, a child of Abraham, a disciple of the king, is not going to be trouble free. If anything, you may end up having more trouble because in this life, because of that. But what did we sing just a few minutes ago? I promise it's just in a few minutes. We sing about the faith of our fathers, and there were words like dungeon and sword. And then there's this line, and I always, I almost, I almost shake my head, but then I almost don't sing it. I, I'm just a mixture when I sing that song. Because it says, oh, how sweet their children's faith do what? What's the last line of that verse? We just sang it. You sang it. I sang it. To die like them. That doesn't mean that we've got some kind of weird suicidal thing going on at all. Okay? Doesn't mean we're just itching to all become martyrs. Shouldn't mean that. Doesn't. But it does mean that being justified by faith Part of that is having a faith that says, come what may, dungeon, sword, death, I'm good. Because I have a hope that doesn't disappoint me, that will not disappoint me. You go back, and you start remembering what happened in the Garden of Eden. What was lost in the Garden of Eden? Access to the presence of God. He says innocence. That's not in my notes tonight, so, but that, that's true. Access to God walking with them, God's presence. Peace with God, no more. Hope. People who were created and crowned with glory. The glory of God's creation, Psalm 8. That glory is gone. And it's replaced with sin and corruption and rebellion. But what was lost in Eden, in Romans 5, 1 through 5 tonight, and in our lives as those who've been justified by faith, is being restored. It's not fully there yet, but it's 
being restored. What did we just read? Peace with God. Access into his presence, into his grace. Hope of the glory of God. Because, read those words again and feel them. Because of God's love. Let's think about that one as we stand and sing together.